Monday, April 26, the rampage of the coronavirus bringing India's health care system to its knees. The Biden administration and other nations coming to India's aid. We are exploring options to provide oxygen and related supplies. The Department of Defense and USAID are pursuing options to provide oxygen generation systems. We may be in a position to reroute shipments planned for other countries with lower immediate needs. After getting to see just 20 seconds of body cam video, attorneys say a black man killed by sheriff's deputies in North Carolina was shot in the back of the head and had his hands on his car steering wheel when the deputies opened fire. The, the officers was not in no harm of him at all. He got executed. Yeah. It ain't right. It ain't right at all. For the second time in two weeks, Attorney General Merrick Garland opens a broad probe of a major U.S. city's police department. This time, it's Louisville, Kentucky, where Breonna Taylor was killed after a no-knock warrant raid on her apartment. Last week, it was the Minneapolis Police Department. The U.S. Census Bureau releases its first numbers from the 2020 census. The numbers determine what share of House of Representatives each state gets the big winner, Texas, gaining two new seats in the House. Florida gains a seat, as will two more Republican majority states and two Democratic majority states. California, for the first time in its history, to lose one congressional seat. State election officials say that organizers of the recall effort against California Governor Newsom collected enough valid signatures to qualify for the ballot, likely triggering just the second such election in state history. And a tenant in the San Francisco East Bay saves her home from foreclosure in an early test of a new state law designed to help struggling renters around the state. From Pacifica Radio, KPFA in Berkeley, KPFK in Los Angeles, this is the Evening News. I'm Mark Miracle. The Biden administration said today it is providing a range of emergency assistance to India to help the country contain its surging coronavirus infections. The White House says the help includes vaccine materials, therapeutics, and devices that help provide oxygen. India set another record today for new coronavirus infections for a fifth day in a row, with more than 350,000 new cases. Simon Marks of Feature Story News reports. The White House says it's actively exploring the possibility of providing India with oxygen-generating equipment in a bid to help the government in Delhi cope with an overwhelming surge of COVID-19. Other countries are also preparing to send emergency supplies to the country, where another 352,000 cases of coronavirus were reported today. Hospitals in the capital, Delhi, are overwhelmed. FSN's Neha Punia is our bureau chief there. Many people who are unable to get access to medical care are dying even before they can see a doctor or a nurse. Uh, many people are struggling to access something uh, that's become so basic, that's medical oxygen. President Biden spoke with Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi today at the White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki. We are exploring options to provide oxygen and related supplies. The Department of Defense and USAID are pursuing options to provide oxygen generation systems. We may be in a position to reroute shipments plan for other countries with lower immediate needs. She also said the U.S. will send the ingredients that will allow India to manufacture additional COVID-19 vaccines, but an anticipated 60 million spare doses of AstraZeneca's jab will not be made available by the U.S. to other countries for weeks to come. 
Simon Marks reporting. India has recorded 350,000 new coronavirus infections in the past 24 hours as the surge in cases and deaths shows no sign of slowing down. Hospitals overwhelmed without enough beds, oxygen and other supplies. This hospital administrator's remarks appeared on Al Jazeera. <laughs> We are constantly afraid. For the past five to six days, we are getting oxygen in parts. One ton, two tons, half a ton during different parts of the day. We need five tons of oxygen every day. Only we know how difficult it is for us to get by through the evening. We are not even having enough sleep at night because of the crisis. I would like to thank the police and the government for doing the best they can, but it is not enough. Many have denounced Prime Minister Narendra Modi for mismanaging the pandemic. He's responded by ordering social media to take down the criticism of his handling of the crisis. Dr. John Schwartzberg, clinical professor emeritus of infectious diseases at UC Berkeley School of Public Health, on the situation in India on today's Upfront program. What is happening there and how can we in the United States be sure that we're not going to follow suit? Well, what's happening there is a horrific tragedy. Um, the numbers probably that you just relate are probably well below the actual numbers of cases and actual numbers of deaths that we're seeing there. We've heard from um, multiple news sources that hospitals are overrun that supplies for basic things like PPE and oxygen and drugs to treat COVID are in short supply. So we're seeing just a, a tragedy unfolding right now in India, and it's just horrific to see. There's a lot of debate as to why India and why right now, because India has throughout the pandemic done exceptionally well. And some people have actually argued that it's done so well that it's made them overconfident or it made them overconfident. There are lots of different holiday celebrations with millions of millions of people en masse getting together that likely are contributing a great deal to this problem that they're having. As well, there's a new variant in India, we don't know how big of a role that's playing, but it may very well be significant. But there are likely other factors that are playing a role. Bottom line, a tragedy that's going on, and India needs help. And the United States is in a perfect position right now to help India. And I was pleased to hear the announcements yesterday that PPE, medications, uh, infrastructure, testing, equipment, um, Many things like that are being sent to India. I just hope we can get it there in time to help a lot of people. Dr. John Schwarzberg of the U.S. Berkeley School of Public Health spoke with Kat Brooks, host of KPFA's Upfront Morning Show. The Centers for Disease Control and Prevention is set to revise outdoor masking guidelines as soon as this week as the number of vaccinated Americans rises. Public health officials say different guidelines for people who have been fully vaccinated and those who haven't got a shot yet. White House Chief Medical Advisor Dr. Anthony Fauci told ABC Sunday the risk of transmission is low for vaccinated people. What the country is going to be going to be hearing soon is updated guidelines from the CDC. The CDC is a science-based organization. They don't want to make any guidelines unless they look at the data and the data backs it up. But when you look around at the common sense situation, obviously the risk is really very low, particularly if you're vaccinated. Health experts say that more data is showing that the risk of infection in an outdoor setting is quite low. The CDC does warn that masks should continue to be worn inside till more people are vaccinated, about 42% of the U.S. population has received at least one vaccination.
Officials say the European Union is finalizing plans to allow tourists from the United States to travel to Europe this summer. The European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen told the New York Times that fully vaccinated U.S. residents would be able to visit EU countries this summer since all coronavirus vaccines currently used in the U.S. have also been approved by the EU's drug regulator. The European Commission didn't say when exactly tourists will be allowed back inside the European bloc and if a reciprocal approach will apply to European tourists who want to travel to the United States. After months of keeping Floridians in prisons and jails off the priority list for a COVID vaccine, the state of Florida is finally distributing the shots. But despite their vulnerability to the disease, many locked up inside are skeptical. Tremel Gomes has a story. Florida's Department of Corrections secretary issued a recent statement with a personal appeal to staff and anyone incarcerated to get the shot. But families and advocacy groups say good information is hard to come by from the inside. So people are leery. Denise Rock with the Florida Cares Charity Corporation says the department should do more to establish trust around the vaccine because misinformation sticks. Like, I think that probably what's being said is the same stuff that we hear in society, but they're hearing it differently, being incarcerated and not having you know, information or being exposed to information. Rock praises the corrections department for making the vaccines available, although it is still tight-lipped. It says about 33,000 people have elected to receive a vaccination, but they're tracked by a person's county residency and lumped into the countywide statistics collected by the Florida Department of Health. Trish Brown with the Tallahassee Community Action Committee says the state should have released people who are most vulnerable and could still do so, since the facility aren't equipped to manage a pandemic. She says she's hearing from people inside who are worried. We're scared and we're worried. Again, the, the way the prisons are set up where people are in like close spaces, it's just, this just, just not conducive um, to continue to keep allowing people. Her group and others are recommending at least providing people behind bars with information on paper because they're hearing only those who choose to be vaccinated get access to additional information. They believe it's important to give people the time and details they need to make an informed decision. For Florida News Connection, I'm Tramel Gomes. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson today dismissed as total rubbish a press report which quoted him as allegedly saying he would rather see bodies pile high in their thousands than impose a third national lockdown on the country. The Daily Mail claimed that Johnson made the comment during a heated discussion in late October when his government imposed a second lockdown to combat a surge in coronavirus cases. A third lockdown was ordered in January as infections shot up again, driven by a new, more contagious variant of the virus. The Daily Mail did not cite a source for the claim, but there's been a spate of leaks from Johnson's 10 Downing Street office, which are being investigated by government officials. Broadcasters BBC and ITV said they had also been told of the body's remark. The claims the latest in a swirl of allegations of cronyism and ethical breaches against Prime Minister Johnson and his conservative government that have been piling up ahead of local and regional elections next week. The Prime Minister's former top aide, Dominic Cummings, claimed last week that Johnson planned to get Conservative Party donors to fund the refurbishment of the Prime Minister's Downing Street apartment. Reporter Lauren McCone Isherwood in London. From leaked text messages to claims Conservative Party donors were asked to pay for Downing Street renovations. There have been denials aplenty from the UK Prime Minister in the last few weeks. Now Boris Johnson has issued another one. After reports, he said he was prepared to let bodies pile high rather than impose a national lockdown last year. The PM's official spokesperson said it is untrue. Ministerial allies have come out in support too. Lauren McCann Isherwood reporting from London. And you're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online 
at kpfa.org. California will lose one of its 53 congressional seats. That's according to newly released numbers from the 2020 census. Texas will gain two seats. As part of an historically small shift from the northeastern and midwestern states in favor of the south and the west. Christopher Martinez reports. The Census Bureau has released its first numbers from the 2020 Census count. The Bureau released its state-by-state count at a news conference Monday. To all those that responded, thank you for participating in democracy. Gina Raimondo is the Secretary of Commerce, heading the department that oversees the Census Bureau. Earlier today, I had the privilege of transmitting the 2020 census population and apportionment counts for each state to the president. Per the Constitution, these counts determine the apportionment of seats in the U.S. House of Representatives. This is a unique ritual that has occurred only 23 other times in American history. I assured the president that the census was complete and accurate. She described the census count as a challenge because of the COVID pandemic, wildfires, hurricanes, and civil unrest. Another challenge she did not mention was then-President Donald Trump's failed attempt to add a citizenship question to the census form. Despite the delays, the first round of numbers are in. Ron Jarman is acting director of the Census Bureau. He describes the census as a snapshot of all people living in the U.S. on April 1st of last year. The total count is 331.5 million people. This represents an increase of 7.4% over the official population count from the 2010 census. This population growth rate is lower than the previous growth rate of 9.7% between the 2000 and 2010 censuses. In fact, the growth rate from from 2010 to 2020 is the second slowest in U.S. history. The census numbers will be used to determine what share each state gets out of the 435 seats in the House of Representatives. Jarman says since 1940, there has been a regional trend for an increase in congressional seats in the South and West and a loss for the Northeast and Midwest. Overall, the effect of the official 2020 uh, census population counts on congressional apportionment is a shift of seven seats among 13 states which is the smallest number of seats shifting among the states in any decade since the current method of calculating apportionment was adopted in 1941. This time around, Texas is the big winner, gaining two new seats in the House, though it had been expected to gain three. Florida will also gain a seat, as will two more Republican-majority states, Montana and North Carolina, and two Democratic-majority states, Colorado and Oregon. Seven states will lose one seat each, including, for the first time in its history, California. Karen Battle is chief of the Population Division for the Census Bureau. From our Population Estimates Program, we know that over the last decade um, that California um, has actually experienced natural increase where they were able to gain population because there were more births than deaths. Uh, And they also had positive net international migration, Uh, but California did have negative net domestic migration, where again, there were more people moving out of California than moving into California. And so that contributed to the, um, the population count in the census. Other states losing seats include New York, Illinois, Michigan, Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Ohio. And if you think getting counted doesn't matter, consider what happened in New York, according to the Population Division's Kristen Kolsop. What we have is that if New York had had 89 more people, they would have received one more seat instead of the last state that received their last seat. There are 435 seats, so the last seat went to Minnesota. The population shifts, and the resulting change in congressional seats seem to give a small, short-term advantage to Republicans in future congressional elections. But longer-term demographic changes, such as increasing numbers of Democrats in red states like Texas, put a question mark over how long the changes will favor Republicans. The Census Bureau plans to send states more detailed data for redistricting by the end of August. Other more detailed data, including data on race, sex, and ethnicity, will come by the end of September. Those detailed numbers will be used by the federal government to allocate about $1.5 trillion in spending each year.
Reporting for Pacifica Radio News KPFA, I'm Christopher Martinez. The United States Supreme Court was to hear a California case today involving top donors to two conservative nonprofit groups, including one with links to billionaire Charles Koch. At issue is whether California can collect the names and addresses of those making the biggest contributions. Two of the conservative groups, Americans for Prosperity Foundation and the Thomas More Law Center, argue that the state's disclosure requirement violates the first Amendment and would deter people from giving. A federal appeals court in San Francisco had ruled that the information serves the important state goal of preventing charities from committing fraud and was unlikely to be released publicly. Americans for Prosperity Foundation is incorporated as a charitable organization. It's the primary political organization supported by Koch and his late brother David, who died in 2019. Koch's organizations have spent hundreds of millions of dollars supporting Republican candidates and conservative policies. Three lawmakers asked Supreme Court Justice Amy Coney Barrett to recuse herself from the case. Senators Sheldon Whitehouse and Richard Blumenthal and Congressman Hank Johnson noted that when former President Trump nominated her, Americans for Prosperity vowed to mount a full-scale campaign for her confirmation. The three wrote that statute, constitutional case law, common sense, all would seem to require Judge Barrett's recusal. The U.S. Supreme Court has agreed to hear a case seeking to expand the legal right to carry handguns outside the home. The justices said they'll review a lower court ruling that had upheld New York's restrictions on gun permits. New York requires someone seeking to carry a concealed handgun to demonstrate a special need. The Giffords Law Center to Prevent Gun Violence called the court's decision to hear the case a reckless response following the series of shootings in the last month. It said the court action is a warning side that the majority of justices on the Supreme Court is poised to side with gun lobby groups seeking to eliminate even the most modest firearm laws. The court turned down review of the issue back in June, but that was before Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg died and Justice Amy Coney Barrett replaced her. The U.S. Justice Department is opening a sweeping probe into policing in Louisville, Kentucky over the March 2020 fatal shooting of Breonna Taylor. Attorney General Merrick Garland said the Justice Department will open a probe into whether the Louisville Police Department engages in unconstitutional or unlawful policing. Today, the Justice Department is opening a, opening a civil investigation into the Louisville-Jefferson County Metro Government and the Louisville Metro Police Department to determine whether LMPD engages in a pattern or practice of violations of the Constitution or federal law. The 26-year-old woman was shot to death by police during a no-knock warrant raid on her home. Police were looking for drugs. None were found. Taylor was asleep when police knocked down her door with a battering ram. Her boyfriend, Kenneth Walker, fired once. Police fired a barrage of shots. Attorney General Garland said the federal probe will also include whether the Louisville Police Department violates the rights of people engaging in peaceful activities and whether police conduct whether they conduct unconstitutional stops, searches and seizures, or illegally execute search warrants. The Louisville police chief in charge at the time of Taylor's fatal shooting was fired. The new chief, Erica Shields, said she welcomes the federal probe and is not surprised by it. It's necessary because police reform, quite honestly, is needed in near every agency across the country. And if us at Louisville LMPD are going to be one of the flagship departments for change, then bring it on.
Former Minneapolis police officer Derek Chauvin was convicted last week of murder in George Floyd's death, but no one has been charged in Taylor's fatal shooting. Attorney General Garland announced last week a similar Justice Department probe of the Minneapolis Police Department. State offices were closed today in Alabama and Mississippi for Confederate Memorial Day. South Carolina also celebrates Confederate Memorial Day, but in the month of May. The Alabama-based Southern Poverty Law Center used the day to call the removal of monuments to the Confederacy. The law center says 170 were removed across the nation last year. The center says Confederate symbols erected by Southern heritage groups were used by white supremacists as tools of racial terror. Sacramento County District Attorney Anne Marie Schubert announced today she's challenging newly appointed State Attorney General Rob Bonta for his job next year. Schubert, who is a Republican, is known for her work bringing the Golden State Killer to justice in 2018. She also led efforts to unveil perpetrators behind a massive EDD fraud scheme. Schubert told the Sacramento Bee that she's done nothing else in her life other than being a public safety advocate, and she believes the attorney general job should not be political. Over the past decade, Schubert's challenged Democratic-backed ballot initiatives that lightened criminal sentences and made it easier to release nonviolent inmates on parole. As a member of the legislature representing the East Bay, new Attorney General Bonta has advocated criminal justice reforms, including ending the money bail system. During Sexual Assault Awareness Month, groups are raising awareness about black women's contributions in the quest to end sexual violence. Lily Bolke reports. About one in three black women has experienced some form of sexual violence in her lifetime, according to the National Center on Violence Against Women in the Black Community. And for every black woman who reports a rape, at least 15 do not. Jaya Colasetti with the Women's Resource Center at the University of Illinois says from early court cases about workplace sexual harassment to the more recent Me Too movement, Black women have been at the forefront of creating new support systems for survivors. I think sometimes we tend to view social issues in isolation instead of talking about how they might be connected, how they might reinforce each other. If we're going to address sexual violence, we have to be willing to tackle other forms of harm, other forms of oppression. The Women's Resource Center holds a series of virtual events this week open to the public, including showing a documentary, The Rape of Recy Taylor, about a young black woman speaking out against a group of white male attackers in 1944, Alabama. The film features Rosa Parks, who before she was involved in the Alabama bus boycotts, was an advocate for survivors for the NAACP. The pandemic has isolated more families at home, and the stress, fear, and sense of hopelessness has also elevated the risk of sexual violence, particularly particularly intimate partner violence. Colsetti says prevention is key in addition to supporting survivors. So thinking about how do we create safer environments, how do we create culture change so that incidents of sexual violence will decrease. Survivors of sexual violence in need of support can call 1-800-656-HOPE, 1-800-656-4673 to reach the 24-7 National Sexual Assault Hotline. It will connect callers to local service providers who can help. For Illinois News Connection, I'm Lily Bolke. The Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes of northwest Montana have finalized their plan to improve coordination and agency response when indigenous people go missing in the Flathead area of their reservation as part of a national response by the Department of Justice to a nationwide problem of missing and murdered Native Americans. And it's intended to be a model for other tribes. Caitlin Nicholas of Yellowstone Public Radio reports. CSKT has been developing their tribal community response plan since December 2020. The plan focuses on identifying and updating policies of law enforcement, victim services, media communication, and a log of community resources to streamline what happens when someone goes missing. Ellie Bundy, a CSKT council member and the presiding officer of the Montana Missing Indigenous Persons Task Force, 
announced the plan's completion in a task force meeting Wednesday. She says one major accomplishment is the plan brings all 10 law enforcement agencies working with CSKT into alignment. Our law enforcement agencies establish a common missing Indigenous persons response policy, which is huge. The plan also establishes a joint file system where law enforcement agencies can view and share information on cases, as well as a media lead for all CSKT missing persons communication. Bundy urged task force members to remember the people behind the missing persons statistics and policies. She spoke about the life of Jermaine Charlot, a CSKT woman who's been missing since 2018. She also told stories of other missing and murdered Indigenous people, including Ashley Loring Heavy Runner, a Blackfeet woman who's been missing since June 2017, and Selena Not Afraid, a Crow teenager who was found dead in January 2020. And so the numbers I want you to consider today, 16, 18, 20, 21, 22, 23, the ages of these young ladies when they went missing. Think of someone in your family who may be that age. Bundy says a particularly important part of developing the response plan was inviting family members of victims to discuss how procedures could be made more efficient based on their experiences. In Montana, for National Native News, I'm Caitlin Nicholas. And you are listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK, Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. It's an hour-long newscast, airs each night at 6. It's a half-hour edition on the weekends. All the newscasts are archived online at kpfa.org. They're also available as podcasts. I'm Mark Miracle. The U.S. Supreme Court refused to consider Texas's challenge to California's ban on state-funded business trips to Texas, Texas and other states that discriminate against LGBTQ people. California adopted the ban following a 2017 Texas law that allows foster care and adoption agencies to deny services based on religious objections to gay people. Justices Samuel Alioto and Claris Thomas voted to hear the case. The other seven justices declined to. The Missouri House of Representatives has advanced a bill aimed to ban transgender kids from participating in girls' sports, which advocates say is just the latest in a growing list of legislative attacks on trans youth across the country. Lily Bulky reports. More than 250 anti-LGBTQ bills have been introduced in 2021 alone, according to the Human Rights Campaign. Shira Berkowitz with PROMO, a statewide LGBTQ advocacy group, says regardless of whether or not the ban is signed into law, it sends a message to trans kids that they don't belong, which can be extremely detrimental to their mental health. It's important to work all the time, not just during our legislative session, to educate our elected leaders and Missourians about the importance of making sure that trans kids, who are some of our most vulnerable population, have the same opportunities to thrive as their peers. Another bill, which has been introduced but not advanced, would deny essential life-saving medical care to trans kids. It would make it a criminal offense for doctors to prescribe treatments to people younger than 18, such as puberty blockers or hormone therapy, which have been established as best practice, age-appropriate, gender-affirming care. It would also penalize parents for seeking this type of care for their kids. Berkowitz says lessons such as teamwork, sportsmanship, leadership, and self-discipline are all incredibly rich values that all kids should have, regardless of gender identity. The Missouri State High School Activities Association already has guidelines in place that allows transgender students to participate in sports, and it's been working. So elected leaders are really trying to dig up an issue and present a problem that doesn't exist. Republican lawmakers in Arkansas, Mississippi, and Tennessee have passed similar bans on trans athletes, and bills are awaiting governor's signatures in Alabama, Kansas, Montana, and West Virginia. Arkansas is the only state yet that has banned best practice medical care for trans kids, although more than 35 similar bills have been introduced nationwide. For Missouri News Service, I'm Lily Bolke. Oklahoma Governor Kevin Stitt signed three anti-abortion bills into law today. Stitt announced on Twitter that he signed laws requiring physicians who perform abortions to be certified in obstetrics. Another added 
performing abortions to the list of unprofessional conduct by doctors. And a third prohibits abortions if a fetal heartbeat is detected. The New York-based Center for Reproductive Rights has successfully sued to overturn numerous anti-abortion bills in Oklahoma and says it's considering all options to ensure the laws don't take effect. Governor Stitt says he also signed a bill to make Oklahoma a so-called Second Amendment sanctuary state. The bill declares any attempt to confiscate or buy back firearms in the state to be unconstitutional. A legal battle is unfolding over the Biden administration's moratorium on oil and gas lease sales on public lands. Eric Galatis reports. Wyoming and industry groups filed lawsuits to block the move in federal court, and last week, 21 farmers, ranchers, conservation, recreation, and tribal groups countered with a suit defending the administration's efforts to determine if leasing unfairly benefited companies over taxpayers and the need to mitigate climate change. Eric Huber with the Sierra Club Environmental Law Program says fossil fuel development on public lands is a major contributor of climate pollution. So roughly a quarter of the United States' contribution to greenhouse gases that cause climate change are coming from oil and gas and coal and other things coming from our public lands. Conservationists say the pause is also a necessary step toward addressing the disproportionate health impacts from air pollution on low income and communities of color. Opponents claim the move will lead to job loss and hurt state and local economies. Thirteen states also filed suit in a Louisiana federal court arguing regular lease sales are required by law. The administration's pause to review the leasing program does not affect the oil and gas industry's current stockpile of some 13 million acres of public land leases, many purchased for as little as $2 an acre. Huber says the pause for new leases will not disrupt current fossil fuel production. The industry has thousands of leases already locked up. So there's not going to be an immediate effect in terms of loss of jobs or stopping any ongoing fracking. Huber says oil and gas leasing also prevents other uses on lands owned by all Americans, including recreation, tourism, and other sustainable economies he believes benefit communities far more in the long run. The Biden administration is expected to release an interim report on its review of the leasing program this summer. This is Eric Galatis reporting for the Wyoming News Service. Environmental justice groups, which have long called on state leaders to stop fracking, say Governor Newsom's announced ban is the first step, but not enough. Newsom on Friday said he will stop issuing fracking permits by 2024 and halt all oil extraction by 2045, long after he's left office. The group Food and Water Watch called Newsom's move a half measure, which will allow fracking to continue for two and a half years. Food and Water Watch said the Newsom administration needs to stop issuing permits now. The Center for Biological Diversity said Newsom's announcement phasing out fracking is historic and globally significant, but said... There's not time for studies and delays. The center said every new fracking and drilling permit does more damage to public health and the climate. Environmental groups are also calling on Newsom to impose a 2,500-foot buffer zone between fossil fuel production wells and nearby homes, hospitals, and schools. Suzanne Potter has that story. Clean air advocates say they have mixed emotions about California's plan to phase out fracking. On Friday, Governor Gavin Newsom said the state will not issue new fracking permits starting in 2024 and will work to end extraction of oil and gas by 2045. Kobe Nasek is with a group called Vision, which stands for Voices in Solidarity Against Oil and Gas in Neighborhoods. He says the move is a huge step toward climate justice, but he'd like to see a mandatory 2,500-foot setback for new or re-permitted wells to keep them away from homes, schools, hospitals, and retirement homes. Taking a look at the science, it's very easy to see that 2,500 feet is the minimum that we need to protect people, especially pregnant mothers, from the negative health impacts that include cancer, asthma, and now a higher risk of COVID-19 mortality. Opponents of the governor's plan say it will cost jobs and increase the state's dependence on imported oil. A bill to ban fracking, SB 467, failed a few weeks ago in committee. 
A slimmed down version that solely focuses on buffer zones currently lacks the votes to pass. California is the only major oil producing state that does not require setbacks near wells in order to control air pollution. Dan Ress with the Center on Race, Poverty and the Environment says setbacks would only lead to the closure of a small percentage of wells but would have a big impact on health in low-income communities. So 1% annually is not a huge drop-off in production. We see no reason that would lead to major cuts in jobs or revenue for local government. According to a 2020 investigation from the L.A. Times and the Center for Public Integrity, more than 2 million Californians live within half a mile of an active well or one that is inactive but unplugged. For California News Service, I'm Suzanne Potter. State election officials said that organizers of the recall effort against California Governor Newsom collected enough valid signatures to qualify for the ballot, likely triggering just the second such election in state history. People who signed petitions now have 30 days to withdraw their signatures, though it's unlikely enough will do so to stop the question from going to voters. The recall against Newsom, a first-term Democrat seen as a possible White House hopeful someday, will be among the highest-profile political races in the country this year. He launched a campaign to fight the effort in March alongside endorsements from Democrats, including Senators Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. So far, no other Democrats have jumped in to run against him. I'm not going to take this fight lying down, read a fundraising appeal sent by Newsom shortly after today's announcement about the signatures. There's too much at stake and I intend to win, he said. His campaign manager, Juan Rodriguez, repeated criticism that the campaign is a partisan effort by pro-Trump Republicans that seeks to undo the important progress that the governor has made. Fighting COVID, supporting families who are struggling, protecting the environment, common sense, gun safety laws. An election is likely in the fall and voters would face two questions. Should Newsom be recalled and who should replace him? The votes on the second question would only be countered if more than half said yes to the first. If Newsom survives the recall, he'll be up for re-election in 2022. Republicans running to replace Newsom include former San Diego Mayor Kevin Falconer and reality television star and former Olympic decathlon champion Caitlyn Jenner, who has never run for elected office. Businessman John Cox, who lost badly to Newsom in 2018, and former Congressman Doug Oz are also running. Dozens of other candidates, serious and or not, are expected to enter the race. Only one other time a governor has faced a recall election. That was in 2003 when Democrat Gray Davis was voted out and replaced with Republican Arnold Schwarzenegger. A bill that would create a council to establish minimum standards on wages, working hours, and health and safety conditions for fast food workers has cleared a state assembly committee. The Assembly Committee on Labor and Employment approved Assembly Bill 257, the so-called Fast Recovery Act, would grant fast food workers the ability to set their own workplace health, safety, and employment standards as part of a statewide fast food sector council. Supporters of the bill say it would hold fast food companies that refuse to abide by workplace standards accountable and protect whistleblowers from retaliation. Although the fast food industry is one of the fastest growing industries in the economy, fast food workers are often paid the lowest. Labor groups say fast food workers also often deal with wage theft, harassment, unsafe working conditions, adding that the coronavirus pandemic has only made things worse. Democratic State Assembly member Lorena Gonzalez of San Diego introduced the bill. She says that during the pandemic, fast food workers are forced to work in conditions that leave them vulnerable to infection. However, Gonzalez says that fast food workers are routinely subject to health and safety violations that will continue even after the pandemic is over. Lizette Agliar is a former fast food worker at McDonald's in Los Angeles and a leader in the Fight for 15 movement. Fight for 15 is an advocacy group 
campaigning for a $15 minimum wage and the right to unionize. Agliar says her workplace refused to abide by health and safety rules and failed to enforce mask wearing or social distancing regulations. Agliar says that once she organized a strike, she was fired. She told the Labor Committee about the workplace conditions that many fast food employees face. I refuse to be intimidated or silence because I know workers like me deserve better. Recently in L.A., the KFC worker was shot in the chest with a BB gun and forced to finish the reminder of a six-hour shift. And in San Francisco, McDonald's this week, workers have stepped forward about sexual harassment. In the past of 15 in a union, we have organized our co-workers and gone on a strike to protest conditions like this. But with a couple million of workers in this industry, imagine how many workers are scared to speak up. Opponents argue that the Fast Recovery Act will destroy the franchise model of fast food restaurants by shifting power to set workplace standards to employees. Michael M. Mendelson is a franchisee of multiple fast food restaurants in California, a member of the California Restor- Restaurants Association. She says that the health and safety violations described by Egli are not the norm. Uh, I'm appalled by some of the by the story told by the one employee, and and that was obviously uh, 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 an owner of a restaurant that was not handling things properly. But in in my restaurant and in restaurants owned by franchisees that I know, uh, things were quite different during the pandemic. When it hit, we set our minds that the safety of our employees and our customers was our primary responsibility. Republican Assemblymember Kelly Serrato spoke in support of Mendelssohn. He argued that because essential workers are increasingly being replaced by automation, the health and safety of workers will soon become irrelevant. Assemblymember Lorena Gonzalez says the robot argument has been used to excuse workplace violations since she worked in the labor movement 20 years ago. Gonzalez says that despite advances in technology that may soon replace fast food workers, the Fast Recovery Act is necessary right now. I think back to the workers who I fought to protect 20 years ago, who um, spent the last 20 years in conditions because robots didn't replace them. So I think it's really important to realize, yes, technology will happen. There will be advancement in the workplace. But in the meantime, we don't throw away workers. We don't say it's okay that they're in unsafe working conditions or it's okay they don't have a voice on the job. The bill will be heard in the Assembly Judiciary Committee on Tuesday. You're listening to the Evening News on KPFA Berkeley, KPFK Los Angeles, KFCF Fresno, online at kpfa.org. This is Kat Brooks. I'm an actor, activist, and freedom fighter. And I'm Brian Edwards Teekert. I mostly do journalism, which kind of sounds boring now. And together, we host Upfront, KPFA's local two-hour morning magazine. We bring you breaking news, debates, deep dives. Reporting on City Hall and the State House. Housing and transportation. Prisons and police. And everything big that happened while you were sleeping. And it means the two of us get to hang out with you at 7 a.m. Right after Democracy Now! on Upfront. A tenant in the San Francisco East Bay was able to save her home from foreclosure after a Bay Area land trust company stepped in to purchase the home she was renting. As KPFA Sam Anderson reports, it's an early test of a new state law designed to help struggling tenants statewide. Jocelyn Foreman was without permanent housing for six years. She surfed on couches, stayed with relatives, and dealt with the constant anxiety of not knowing where she and her children were going to stay next. She had finally found a home to rent in Pinole, but after just two years, the house was facing foreclosure and went up for auction. A California-based company called Wedgwood Properties bought the house for $600,000, and Foreman said she faced being without a home once again. Wedgwood is known for flipping distressed properties, notably the one occupied by the Oakland housing advocacy group Moms for Housing. The unhoused mothers occupied an empty house in Oakland to raise awareness of housing insecurity in early 2020. According to an investigation by KQED, the company has scooped up more than 270 distressed properties just since the start of the pandemic in 2020. 
The Moms for Housing struggle prompted state lawmakers to create SB 1079. The law gives tenants the right of first refusal when a house goes up for auction. It meant Jocelyn could stay in her home if she was able to meet the bid of $600,000. She knew it was a long shot, but decided to try and raise the money. This house was so important to me. And the reason why it was important was because it was my opportunity to break cycles for myself and for my children. And now I have three grandchildren, and they are my legacy. And in that house, my mother took her last breath. Foreman has teamed up with a number of local community organizers, including Christine Hernandez, co-director of the Radical Real Estate Law School. The women began fundraising. Foreman said things went slowly at first, but eventually they raised more than $100,000 from more than 900 individual donors. But she said it still wasn't enough, so Hernandez reached out to the Northern California Community Land Trust, or NCLT. Community land trusts are local organizations that purchase land and keep it permanently affordable for tenants. But as nonprofits, they don't always have huge amounts of cash on hand. Francis McElveen is the director of real estate for NCLT. He said their projects usually take months, if not years, to put together. But with a lot of community support, they made it happen. This was a unicorn of a case because of Jocelyn, because of who she is, because of the network of people around her, because of how much support she has in this community. But this was one time. So if we want to address the wave of foreclosures that is on the horizon, we have got to fully fund the implementation of SB 1079. In just 45 days, Hernandez said the NCLT came up with the $600,000 needed to purchase the property. I am beyond words right now. This bill, SB 1079, has changed the face of home ownership for a lot of people. And I want to say, this is not a moment. This is a movement. Thank you. Because of the new law and help from the Community Land Trust, Jocelyn and her family not only will be able to stay in their home, she will also have the opportunity to buy it. Under the land trust arrangement, NCLT will retain ownership of the land the home sits on, which will ensure it remains affordable for generations to come. Christine Hernandez says land trusts can be a powerful tool for addressing the housing crisis and creating a pathway to home ownership for people who may not qualify for traditional housing loans. That's especially true in California, she said, which has the second lowest rate of home ownership in the country. One of the big picture goals is to have people who are struggling with housing security recognize this as the opportunity that it is. I think land trusts have historically served like certain populations of people, and I think that there's a cultural shifting that's happening. That's why I'm so excited that Jocelyn has joined this movement and that she will now be living in a community land trust owned property. Her success story is going to make this relatable to a lot of people like her. But not every tenant will have a network that can fundraise like Jocelyn. To ensure that other tenants have the opportunity to benefit from this legislation, advocates say the state government should provide funding for SB 1079. Legislators are asking for $103 million to be set aside for that purpose in this year's state budget. Reporting for KPFA, I'm Sam Anderson. In North Carolina today, the family of Andrew Brown Jr. was allowed to see the body cam video of his fatal shooting last week by sheriff's deputies. Attorneys for the family say the officer shot Brown in the back of the head as he tried to flee his driveway where the officers had come to serve a drug-related arrest warrant. Jay Summers reports. Lawyers for Brown's family say that after a week of stalling, an attorney for North Carolina's Pasquotank County allowed Andrew Brown Jr.'s family to see body cam footage of his killing last Wednesday after heavy redaction. The family's attorneys described rude treatment by Pasquotank County attorney Michael Cox. The attorney said it was Cox who made the decision to redact the video. Brown's family say the department has footage from at least eight officers' body-worn cameras, a sheriff's vehicle dashboard camera, and a nearby CCTV camera. The family said they were shown only a 20-second clip of video from a single body camera. Brown family attorney Chantel Lassiter spoke outside the sheriff's office after watching the video with her clients. Andrew had his hands on his steering wheel. Mm -hmm. He was not reaching for anything. He wasn't touching anything. He wasn't throwing anything around. He had his hands firmly on the steering wheel. 
they run up to his vehicle shooting. No. No. Yeah. We watched this over and over and over to make sure we were clear at what was going on and what was transpiring. So he backs out, not forward, but backs out away from the officers yeah. who, who still shooting at him, yelling, stop it, motherfucker, goddamn motherfucker. Yeah. Constant yeah. obscenities being yelled at him while he's being shot at in the driveway of his home. And even before it started, they have Okay. We only saw, again, I want, I want y'all to know about those 20 seconds. There was things that transpired before those 20 seconds that we did, we did not see. So I don't know how many shots was fired before the little 20 seconds they allowed us to see. The family said officers could be seen firing into Brown's car with automatic rifles and handguns as he attempted to flee. They said some officers were in full SWAT gear. Others were in plain clothes and bulletproof vests. Brown family attorney Ben Crump says there are two justice systems in America one for black America, and one for white America. I don't know why it is the most dangerous thing to police for a black man to run away from you. You have young white men who are confirmed mass murderers, whether you're talking about the Parkland shooter, they took him alive, whether you're talking about the uh, killer from the Asian spot in Atlanta, they took him alive, Dylan Roof, they took him alive, after they were confirmed mass murderers. But a black man runs from you, and you have to use deadly force? Andrew Brown didn't kill anybody. The people who killed Andrew Brown, they want to protect their identity and protect their rap sheet, but they want to blast Andrew Brown rap sheet out there because that's the playbook. They try to assassinate the character of black people once they kill us because they want to say they're not cons uh, worthy of your consideration, America, where we're here to proclaim our brothers and sisters who they kill are worthy of consideration, respect, and humanity. Seven sheriff's deputies have been placed on leave pending an investigation by the state of North Carolina. Pasquotank County Sheriff Tommy Wooten said he, quote, trusts the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigations and will be transparent with them. North Carolina law allows law enforcement agencies to keep body cam footage from the public unless a judge orders the footage to be released. I'm J.R. Summers for KPFA. Chloe Zhao has made history at the Academy Awards as the first woman of color to win as Best Director. Zhao was born in Beijing, went to college and film school in the United States. Nomad Land was her third feature. Our Spitzer reports. Nomad Land. <laughs> The film took home three Oscars, including the Best Actress Award for Frances McDormand and the Best Director Prize for Chloe Zhao. The Chinese filmmaker became just the second woman ever to win in that category after Catherine Bigelow in 2010. In the night's biggest surprise, Anthony Hopkins beat out the late Chadwick Boseman in the Best Actor category for his work in the film The Father. And that was Iris Spitzer reporting. The East Bay Municipal Util Utility District, EBMUD, is expected to declare a stage one drought at its meeting tomorrow. EBMUD may establish a goal of achieving a voluntary 10% reduction in water use. EBMUD has three quarters of a million customers in the San Francisco East Bay area. Last week in the North Bay, the Marin Municipal Water District banned customers from washing their cars and power washing their homes and driveways. Governor Newsom declared a drought emergency in Mendocino and Sonoma counties in Northern California. California officials say this is the fourth driest year on record, especially in the northern two-thirds of the state. About three-quarters of the western United States is in what's called a mega drought. A small 2.6 magnitude earthquake struck north of Piedmont at 444 this morning. It rattled the studios here at KPFA in Berkeley. Saturday night, a 3.8 magnitude quake hit near San Jose in the South Bay. Sunny tomorrow in the San Francisco Bay Area with highs in the low 60s around the bay. Windy further inland with highs in the low to the mid-70s. Sunny in the central San Joaquin Valley tomorrow with highs in the mid-70s. Los Angeles is predicted to have partly 
cloudy skies tomorrow with highs in the upper 60s. That's it for the news tonight for this Monday, April 26th. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Miracle. Good evening. Monday nights starting at 7 p.m. with Africa Today, a weekly program providing information and analysis about Africa and the African diaspora, hosted by Walter Turner. At 8 p.m., it's a soul sonic rhapsody of word, sound, and power on transitions on traditions, hosted and produced by Greg Bridges. Then at 10 p.m., eclectic beats and rhythms take you into Tuesday with Off the Beaten Path, featuring weekly rotating hosts. That's Monday nights on 94.1 FM, KPFA, and KPFA.org. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5. K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.